Steve, I want to start with you. Northern Illinois shocks the world. 28-point dog with a 16-14 upset win over Notre Dame on Saturday. Naturally, most of the world has checked out on the Fighting Irish, but they're plus 360 to make the 12-team playoff now. Rest of the schedule looks pretty light. Is that price worth a nibble? It could be. Oh, but like I was at College Station for Notre Dame's effort against them. Thought the world of what they had. All the youth on defense, and then you watch Saturday. Northern Illinois beats them at their own game. They rushed for 190 yards and gave it to Notre Dame. Played keep away, and 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 was the better team. And then when you look at Notre Dame moving forward, I don't know what to expect this week. Purdue, that West Lafayette's going to be a zoo this week for a night game with Notre Dame coming in, and then you only have two more road games with Georgia Tech and USC. I just worry there's too much to worry about other teams that they're, that that is going to trouble them. So I will not take the nibble on plus 360. Well, I appreciate your hesitancy, Stanford. <laughs> I think you're just seeing it through Stanford cutter glasses because to me, I'm not going to sprint to the window, but I'm going to briskly pace walk my way to the window and take this price at 360. They're going to be favored in almost every game. Yes, the game against SC at the end of the year, very, very challenging. But I know this. I know Notre Dame has a super elite secondary. And I still, even after mm. the performance that we got from SC the last couple weeks, I still don't know for sure that their defense is going to shut out Notre Dame. I look at just how things have set up also in other places. Tell me the two teams from the ACC that are going to get in. Tell me the two from the Big 12 that are going to get in. I know the SEC might get five in. They're not getting six. And the Big Ten right now with how Oregon's playing, like I don't feel great about a bunch of Big Ten teams getting in either. So Notre Dame at 10-2 and two could very well find their way into the playoff even by a process of elimination. Yeah, I think that's the key. A 10-2 and two Notre Dame, the year we expand to 12, the committee would love to have that matchup in there. I think they could get the benefit of the doubt. That price was shocking. I thought it would be closer around plus 225, plus 250. McElroy, let's stick with you. As you already know, I was uh, – quite aggressive with Utah futures, and now I find myself losing sleep over quarterback Cam Rising, who left Saturday's win over Baylor with a right hand injury. The team is downplaying the situation, but they did kind of do the same thing last year with his knee, and we all know how that turned out. Utah State this week at Oklahoma State next week. How concerned should I be here? Well, I, <laughs> when I am scouring the internet, for some type of update on Cam Rising's injury. I won, by the way, I've seen, I've heard its finger, I've heard its thumb, like, which is it? First and <laughs> foremost, secondly, I found uh, a Twitter video, and this is exactly how we do our due diligence here uh, in the McElroy household. I found a Twitter video where a fan said to Cam Rising, thumbs up if you're healthy, and he gave him a thumbs up. So, hey, to me, that's good. We're good to go. Um, yes, it's of concern, especially knowing that there was some uncertainty about his availability last year. Granted, thumb versus knee, but it is throwing hand, and that could become problematic as this group, and let's just look at the Big 12 as a whole. This is a good, good league against the run for the most part. Like, you really look at it, a lot of these teams are built to stop the run, so the best way to beat some of these teams might be through the air, and Cam Rising's one of the best quarterbacks. So if he's at anything less than 100%, that could be real problematic for the Utes. Yeah, I look at, I agree with Greg and what he said, and then when you look at what Utah did in the portal with all the receivers they brought in, the expectation was that they were gonna throw the football a lot more this year because they had Rising back and they had more talent at the receiver position. So it's a wait and see. Uh, interesting matchup this week. They should be able to get by Utah State, uh, but their old quarterback that played a lot last year, Barnes, he's Utah State's quarterback now. So I, a lot of eyes will be on on them when they go to Stillwater net the following week. But uh, I, I think it's precautionary. I, you should feel all right, Joe. You'll be you'll you'll be, you'll be fine. Yeah, I don't at all. I got a little aggressive, like I said, with that wager. So <laughs> I'd like some more updates, and I'd like Winningham to be a little bit more forthcoming with that information. I don't think that's going to end up happening. Steve, we'll stick with you. Tennessee hangs the 50-burger nope. in a 41-point win over NC State on Saturday. The Volunteers' schedule still features Oklahoma and Georgia in road games, as well as a home date with Alabama. But at this point, they're looking good. Would you bet on them to make the playoffs at plus 115? Absolutely. Uh, you've mentioned a 50-burger. Everybody talks about Nico as the quarterback and what they have. I look at the defense. I, you know, that's always been the, the question with me with Tennessee. What's the defensive talent? 
Pierce might be the best defensive lineman in the SEC. And when you can rely on that, when you got to go on the road and play in places like Norman in Athens, that's something you could hold on to while Nico figures it out. So I love Tennessee, what I saw, but mostly because of the defense. All right, so let's drill down on some of that for a second. Vols quarterback Nico Iamaliava now 10 to 1 to win the Heisman McElroy. Texas signal caller Quinn Yours is your new betting favorite in that market at plus 550. The previous favorite, Dylan Gabriel, has dropped to 12 to 1. Anything you like regarding the Heisman market as we approach week three? Well, is, isn't it funny how your odds can improve so drastically after a two interception performance, one in which that was taken to the house? Like, it's amazing just the way a Heisman's working nowadays. It's like a popularity contest. Pick a quarterback and pick a playoff contender yep. and boom, give him the trophy. Look, I think Nico's got a chance to have a real bright future, but here's what's blowing my mind. In the preseason, I really liked it, but I didn't like the price. Carson Beck plus 750 to win the to Heisman Trophy? Are you kidding me? Like starting quarterback for the Georgia Bulldogs with that schedule? And now I check back two weeks in, he's already got a win against Clemson, super efficient in the process. And I'm getting nine to one? Like, give me Carson Beck all day long. I still don't like the price. I like flyers on the Heisman. And the fact that we're making that play at the end of September is comical, but I still have to acknowledge the road trip to Alabama, road trip to Ole Miss, Road, tr road trip to Texas and likely a rematch of one of those three teams, more than likely, just depending on how things play out in the SEC championship game. And by the way, ABC Prime this week against Kentucky, which is going to have a great broadcasting crew on it. But you look at Carson <laughs> Beck. I mean, these are big stages, big platforms for him to have huge days. And I really think that it's really more about moments than it is about stats at this point. And there's a lot of big moments potentially on the schedule for him to kind of create some distance between him and the rest of the candidates. Texas now plus 260 to win the SEC after that buck kicking they put on the Wolverines in Ann Arbor. Sark's team, is it worth a bet to win the SEC in their first year in the conference? It's Yeah, it's worth a bet. You're getting plus money. Is it possible? For sure. I really liked what I saw being in Ann Arbor last week. The athletes they have on defense. Now, how are they going to stack up when you get the likes of Georgia coming in? The schedule, you met, Greg just mentioned all Georgia's road games. Texas doesn't have that, that tough of a path, in my opinion. So when, with what they looked like and how crisp they were offensively, uh, you got to like what you saw. I just worry if the price, you know, is, is it worth it? Oregon's laying two touchdowns in Corvallis this week against Oregon State as a conference realignment has moved this rivalry game up by about two months. McElroy, given Oregon's early struggles through two weeks, not one, through two weeks, do you think the Beavers could be live here? Well, considering uh, both teams are undefeated heading into this game, it is week three after all, for the first time in 117 <laughs> years. Uh, usually they play this game in November, all right? So naturally there's going to be some hiccups along the lines, but I found that nugget to be somewhat helpful. Yes, the Beavers are live. Yes, it's at their place. You think I feel comfortable laying multiple touchdowns with Oregon based on what I've seen? What I also found fascinating is the steam that we're now getting on the side of the Oregon Ducks. And I understand, look, you can watch them the last couple weeks and say, hey, yeah, they're due. I don't disagree. This line opened around two touchdowns, steamed all the way north to 16 and a hook. It's since been bet down back to 16. I will be watching this one closely. If it sniffs 17, I'm taking it. If it sniffs 17 and a half, that's when I get real anxious because I'm like, all right, what's going on? How did it go through that football number? Not only would I take the 16 and a half, but I'd sprinkle just a hair, just a little bit on the money line. Just saying, just the crazier things have happened. Oregon has looked extremely human these first couple weeks. And I'm trying to figure out, is it real or is it because they've been looking ahead? Well, I know that motivation will be on the side of the Beavers. And I think they have the defense to be able to give that Oregon offensive line a lot of problems. So I like the Beavs in this situation very much live. And like I said, just a little dabble, just a little, just a little ounce, ounce of action on the money sprinkle. Line. Uh, hey, look, it was one thing for Oregon to struggle against Idaho. That's fine. It's week one. It's another thing when you struggle the following week against Boise State. Like at some point, you're going to have to turn on the engines. All right, Steve, given that we don't have any Alabama graduates on the show, I'll come to you on this one. Bama laying 15 at Camp Randall against Wisconsin this weekend. Big early road test for Kalen DeBoer. Where do you kind of see this closing, and is it worth getting involved in this number now or maybe waiting later? 
I, I think this comes down. This is pretty high when you look at what's factored in here. Uh, I think Alabama's biggest question is what's that offensive line going to be, uh, you know, when they go to Madison. And I haven't watched a lot of the Wisconsin tape yet. I just wonder if they have the personnel to really frustrate Jalen Milrow and make them one-dimensional. Uh, you know, Coach Saban talked about this morning about when they played in the in the playoff, Cincinnati, Fickle, really had good talent up, uh, up front on that defensive line, and they really gave Alabama trouble. I just not, we're, I'm not sure if Wisconsin has the talent on the defensive line to constantly disrupt what Alabama wants to do offensively. So if you like Wisconsin, take it now. I think it ends up being – it won't go underneath 14, but I'd say 14, 14 and a half, 15 right there would be the number. I, I guess it closes at. I might hurt a little. I might work a lot.